Good evening. Um, real quick, Chris, you need a clicker for the slides invitation. It's right here. Okay. While we take care of this, a couple announcements. Uh, it was printed in the bulletin, but remember, uh, just a reminder that Miranda's gospel meeting will be running July 21st through the 24th. A flyer has been posted in the lobby. Um, it's a series on evidences, and I'm not shamelessly plugging my own meeting. Um, I will be preaching it. Okay. I will be holding it. It is a series on evidences. Uh, titled Why I Believe, and we'll be going through several. Uh, why I Believe There is a God, the Bible is His Word, Christ is His Son, Why Jesus Rose for the, from the Dead, and Why Jesus is the World's Only and Best Hope. Um, I know they would appreciate any support you can uh, give them uh, by your good attendance. Uh, and again, flyer will be po is posted in the lobby. Um, this evening, if you'll open your Bibles to the book of 1 John, we're going to be starting a series of lessons looking through the letters of John, the May 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. Uh, as with any book of Scripture, there are a rich treasure trove of practical application and knowledge of Scriptures, and, and perhaps there, sometimes we can overlook the smaller letters of, as perhaps not having as much to teach because of their size, but uh, just because of their short length does not indicate the value of their teaching. Uh, so tonight we're going to be looking at kind of like the, the first main thought or so that John presents in 1 John, and that is the whole theme of walking in the light. So looking at 1 John, uh, at the first four verses here, John writes, he says, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, and what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. And the life was manifest. And we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you, so you too might have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship was with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write, so that our joy may be, may be made complete. What I like about the first section, his introduction here, uh, John is writing towards the close of the first century. Um, I believe it's around 90 AD. So by that time frame, John is probably the last living apostle. He has seen that, that inner group of 12. He's seen them one by one be martyred, either through crucifixion, through stoning, Whatever it was, he's the only one left. And in 90 AD, the persecution against the church only looks like it's getting worse, and there's new false teaching going around through the Gnostics who are trying to convince people that whatever you do in your body is not your fault. That, you, know, that's, you can't be held at fault for that. That's your body doing it, not your spirit. Your spirit's inherently good. And John's... And earlier letters, and uh, actually Peter completely rebukes that heresy. John does as well. But John is dealing with the very fact that Jesus was not a myth. Jesus was actually here in the, was incarnate and dwelt among us. The nurse ten of Gnosticism was the fact that Jesus was just a spiritual illusion. I don't know how they got that. Don't ask me. I can't explain it. That's how false teaching works. It oftentimes makes you raise your eyebrows because it, to any normal person, it doesn't make sense. But the point I'm trying to make here is, you notice from John how many times he mentions in these first four verses the things they were witness to, the things they touched, the things they saw. Again, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. It's that word of life that he proclaims to them. Many of you might have noticed that actually there's a lot of parallels between 1 John chapter 1, the first couple of verses, and the Gospel of John, the first couple of verses. They start out the same. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He talks about how the Word was the light of men, and the darkness did not comprehend it, and how the light dwelt among us. And he, was a te uh, he, was, he testified to his wit as witness to the light. 
Again, he kind of in a different wording, but in the same theme here, talks about how what was from the beginning, which was eternal, that it dwelt among us, it was manifest. We have seen and heard, and we preach it to you. For what purpose? It's so we, the readers, can have fellowship with God. And again, you think about this for a moment. He is writing to Christians. Not pagans, not non-believers, Christians who have made the good confession of faith, who have put Christ on in baptism. It shows to us that, again, we are never at such a point where we do not need reminding of the essentials of faith, the fact that Christ dwelt among men, died for our sins, and it's only by him preached can we have fellowship with God. that we can have the same fellowship the apostles had with the Father and His Son, Christ Jesus. You look at, one writer said, it's through the announcement of this testimony, the testimony John has just talked about in the first two verses, regarding Christ, fellowship would be obtained, and the effect of this fellowship would be joy. This, verse 4, is the main thrust and the main point and the main reason why John's writing this letter is so that his, its recipients may have unceasing joy. Now, unceasing joy not as the world knows it. If we're talking about just the feeling, feelings are fleeting and feelings do not last. That's why the whole mantra of whatever you do, just be happy in life, or all I want you to do is be happy, doesn't hold up, and it's not a great mantra to live by. I can have momentary joy from something. Momentary happiness, I should say happiness. Today's lunch brought me momentary happiness. But it was not, it was not lasting. I know it's not lasting because I'm hungry again right now as I speak to you. I like to eat. That will catch up with me one day probably. But that's fleeting. The happiness I get from a sunrise or sunset, that lasts for but a moment. Joy is more permanent. Joy is unceasing. Joy is not a feeling, it's an attitude, it's a, it's a state of being, if you will. The words here for joy and the fact that he says that your joy may be made complete, it's interesting, joy there, you get into the text, it has, carries the idea of a calm delight. One could say the word peace. And the word, the whole phrase, may complete, carries the idea of to cause to abound, to furnish, or to supply liberally. In fact, it was interesting that word for may complete carries the same idea of a fishing net stuff to the point of breaking. Is the imagery it carries in the Greek. And so John's whole purpose is, I am writing to you that you may have this calm delight, this unceasing peace in your life in abundance. Reminds me of what Paul wrote in the book of Philippians chapter 4, and the verses 7. Philippians 4 and verse 7. Rather, backing up to verse 4 so we can get the thrust of Paul's argument here. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be, be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What is this peace that surpasses all comprehension? What does it look like? For me, I'm reminded of one of my favorite uh, historical figures of last century, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who earnestly was trying just to do what the text said in, in, in Nazi Germany. That's where he lived. And he was eventually in prison because of his dissenting views and his involvement with certain plots. And they kept him in one of the worst prisons you can think of. Not yet a concentration camp, but the worst prison you can think of that would have been there for German citizens, which he was. It was a cold, stone, dark prison. And despite 
the harsh treatment, the bad food, being removed from his loved ones and being able to assemble with God's people to worship. He did not get depressed. He continued to write. He continued to pray. He continued to worship. He continued to experience the type of unceasing joy that John is writing and desires us to have. The joy that no one can take away from you. The joy that a believer has in the midst of suffering can still rejoice in God and praise Him. The type of rejoicing that one has even though they are at death's doorstep. They have nothing but to be thankful of, be thankful about. Or they continue to offer thanks, excuse me. Reminds me of a, one of the widow, uh, widows, the last congregation she has since passed on. But even when she was confined to her rest home, could not get out of bed, every time members went to go visit her, she was always rejoicing what God had done for her in her life. And despite her being bedridden and hadn't been able to attend services in years, every once in a while, we would get a visitor. And on our old visitor's cards there, we had a line that said, Guest of. And that lady's name would appear on that card. She had not been able to attend with us in years. But she was still working to bring people to Christ. You look in John chapter 15, in John's discourse there, or the recorded discourse of Jesus after the Last Supper, we look in verses 10 and 11, Christ says to them about the joy he wants us to have, the same joy we've been talking about. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made full. So again, the same joy that Jesus is talking about here in John chapter 15 is the same joy that John talks about here in 1 John. Now how do you get that joy? Going back to 1 John, that joy only comes from a fellowship with God, a communion with God, a, a walking with God. I think a good, a good example biblically of the kind of fellowship what we would want and desire to have with Jehovah is that of Enoch. I love Enoch because in Genesis we know almost nothing about him other than the fact, and the phrase that sticks out in my mind is, Enoch walked with God and then he was not. For the Lord carried him away. Think about that. Enoch had such a close relationship with Jehovah that Jehovah decided, I'm going to spare you physical death. I'm just going to take you now. That closeness that Enoch must have had with Jehovah. That's a pretty high standard, but I think that's a standard we all ought to shoot for. To have the same type of faith as Enoch. That someday in the future generations, that some congregation, wherever we were, where maybe our family members, that they could say of us that they walked with God. But you look here and felt in here in this next section, this next thought, starting in verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you: that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but also for that of the whole world. 
Now we read to verse 2 of chapter 2 because it's unfortunate. The, verse, the chapter and verse divisions help us to some degree, but sometimes it cuts off a thought right in the middle of the speaker. And that's what happened here between John 1 and John 2. That chapter division cuts off John's thought. But that joy only comes from fellowship with God, and there's some things we need to recognize in order to have fellowship with God. The first thing is the fact that God is righteous. We serve a holy and righteous God. And that's the point that Peter reaffirms in verse 5. In him there is no darkness at all. If I haven't been harping on this point enough lately, (laughs) is that the biggest problem that we face today is that so many Christians, including myself, I'll put myself in the category, is either we have forgotten who God is, or we don't really know who God is. His righteousness is absolute. And if we want to have a fellowship with Him, we can have no darkness within ourselves. Now, John will go on to explain some more things as we read briefly. This is Peter's point here in verse 6. He says, if we have fellowship, that communion, that union with him, and yet we walk in the darkness, we are liars, and we are not practicers of truth. This would be the individual, uh, reminded of, read an article a couple weeks ago. Many of you may have seen the news story. That very detestable show, The Bachelor, or Bachelorette, I forget which one's on television now, it doesn't matter, one of those shows. The two contestants were sitting and talking on, I guess they go on several dates to figure out if they're compatible, blah, 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 blah. But the man, talking to the woman, the man was an evangelical Christian, and he took God's laws about purity very seriously. And he said to the lady he's on a date with, he says, it would, it would end it between us if I found out you were sleeping with our contestants. And he quoted Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, which we talked about this morning. Let let marriage be held in honor above all, by all, and the marriage bed be undefiled. Well, she got very defensive about that and says, you have no right to say that. Jesus loves me and I can do whatever I want. I point your attention back to the text. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now, that's an extreme case. I can think of a much more clo- case that comes closer to home. If we say that we have fellowship with God, we are a follower of Jesus, and yet continually and routinely forsake God's people, we lie and we do not practice the truth. We're deceiving ourselves. Now, I want to make the point on the assembly of the Lord's people. We are not talking about those who are unable to assemble. That is a reality, and God understands that. But the, the type of person that would fall in verse 6 is the type of person that wakes up Sunday morning and says, you know, I could, but I won't. That's the type of person we're talking about. The individual who wakes up, you know, Two extra hours of sleep is worth missing church. And that's not just on the services. It's when an individual may have an opportunity to help a brother in need. And they have the ability. And they go, you know, I could, but I won't. The type of person, and this is the thing that I think I'd be honest and speak for all of us, that We've all been there at some point, either in our immaturity, spiritually speaking, or some event in our life that Satan got the better of us. But the blessing is what John continues on to talk about, is the fact that we have, that redemptive, we have the redemptive power of Christ's blood with us to make atonement for that if we are earnestly seeking after him. And you look in 1 Peter, for example, chapter 1, 14, and 16. Again, to 
that reiterate the holiness of God and our obligation to live a holy and righteous life, Peter writes to these Christians, he says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who has called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior. Because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. Peter's main point here is he's time on verse 14. He says, Y'all had enough time. Don't keep on doing the things that you did when you were, when you were young and dumb. You've been enlightened now. You've matured. Live as mature individuals. Live a holy life. Because the God who has called you out of darkness is holy. We have that obligation. Again, going back to 1 John there, verses uh, 6 through 7. Or looking at verse 7 now. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' his Son cleanses us from all sin. Those two phrases, if we yet walk in darkness and walk in the light, carry the idea of a life of habitual action. We are not talking about the Christian who stumbles from time to time. John's going to reaffirm that in just a moment, that we all stumble in many ways. We all mess up. We're not talking about the occasional trip up, but one who says one thing and chooses to live a life completely contrary to what he says. Likewise for righteousness. If we are walking light, it is a life that is characterized by godly living. Not that the person is perfect, but they make an earnest effort to live according to God's precepts. And we cannot live righteously by ourselves. This is the fault, the, the, the trip up, the mistake that some will make is that I can live above sin. I can live such a righteous life, but sin will no longer enter my life and I will no longer be tempted by temptation. John goes, that's an outright lie. Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Basically, what John is saying here to these Christians, okay, if you're saying that you're not living a life that doesn't have some temptation or sins, one, you're a liar, and two, you're calling God a liar. That's not a good position to be in. And we're not then he is not talking about past sins. Because again, he is writing to redeemed Christians. He is talking about sin in the present sense. Those who deny that they have sin add to the sin they already have, and they additionally sin in so affirming that they have no sin, is what John's getting at. I like what one writer said about this text in particular. He said that the ever-present problem of sin is, is added to or, or, or reasoned to or reasoned by the apostles or given as the reason why children of God must have the cleansing power of, of the blood applied. Any previous state of guilt prior to conversion, excuse me, that's the wrong quote. We are beset with sin. We are beset by, by temptation. So long as I am in this flesh, there will, some, there will be something that appeals to me to violate God's will. That is why I need Christ and his blood. Look back in verse 7. If we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' his Son cleanses us of all sin. The believer has the assurance of their salvation when they are faithfully pursuing God and living a life of faith. That faith is characterized by not being, by being uncomfortable when they mess up and going straight to repentance. But the believer has that assurance that if you are living the life, you have the assurance of, of forgiveness from God. Again, Peter reaffirms this in verse 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is the individual 
who outright just ignores the need to live a holy and righteous life, the one who says one thing and does another, who profanes the name of Christ, who forsakes his brethren, forsakes his God, that has no such assurances. The Christian, or so-called Christian, like in that illustration of the woman, Jesus loves me and I can do whatever I want. That is the definition of verse 6, saying we follow him and yet we walk in the darkness. Fellowship with God is the fact we need to live a holy and righteous life and we cannot do it by ourselves. It is only by the power of Christ and his assurance of forgiveness that we can live that righteous life. Again, we still have the responsibility. But it's by Christ that we have that assurance of even when we do mess up, we have access to forgiveness. And so there is no fear and no worry when it comes to standing before God. But the aim is to sin less. We should never be comfortable with the things that beset us in our lives or the temptations that appeal to us. We ought to be working with, in conjuncture with God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit to work at removing the sin from our lives. Because again, look in the first two verses of chapter 2. After he just said this, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. He goes on to say, he says, My little children, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. That's the goal. What John's saying is, I am writing these instructions that you might not sin. But, he says, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, but not only our sins, but also of those of the whole world. I mean, he's hitting the same two points over and over again to get these Christians to understand. The goal is to sin less. But when you mess up, you have Jesus Christ the righteous, who is willing and able to forgive you of your sins if you come to him in repentant faith. Walking in the light, as John is teaching here, is dependent upon my fellowship and continued fellowship with God. He goes in in the next 11 verses of the second chapter, or excuse me, the next verses 3 through 11, about what does that look like? What does walking in the light look like? First, it requires the keeping of the commandments. Because the question you could ask, well, how do I know I'm a child of God? Or how do I know I'm walking in the light? And he says, by this, in verse 3, we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we have come to, that, excuse me, by this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought, not, ought himself to walk in the same manner which he walked. We read a little further there, but um, again, John's not afraid to call individuals out. If you're saying one thing and you're doing another, you're a liar. You think about that. But walking in light, and this seems pretty obvious, is keeping these commandments. Doing your best to live by the precepts God has given us. We already read uh, just a moment ago in John chapter 15, but in John chapter 14, a similar statement is made by Christ. In one of the last recorded sermons we have of him, in the 15th verse of John chapter 14, He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It amazes me so often when you find an individual who claims a faith in Christ or claims that they love the Lord and then outright just dismiss 90% of what the Lord had to teach. I wholeheartedly believe and still affirm that if Jesus were here today, and were to try and preach in many of the mainline churches today, he would be kicked out. A message of doom, destruction, repentance, holy and righteous living. Granted, there was also the message of love and peace and salvation, but Jesus preached a lot 
on the need to repent of sins and to live a righteous life. Stuff that goes contrary to what many believe today. But going back to 1 John here, he goes on to further expand. I mean, he calls out the individual. He says, the one who says in verse 4, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. We've been studying discipleship Wednesday nights. And that whole idea of a disciple is one who has completely devoted his life to the teachings and lifestyle of his master. A Christian is a specific kind of disciple. When one is born again and surrenders himself to Jesus, dies to self, and is raised to walk a new life in the waters of baptism, they have put on the name of Christ. They are calling themselves after Jesus himself. And they have the obligation to live a life in the likeness of Christ. That's the whole work of sanctification. That ongoing process of being more conformed in the image of Christ in his life. But the telltale mark of one who is walking in the light is one who is walking in the same manner as Jesus himself walked. But you'll look here in the next couple verses as we round this out. Walking the light is overwhelmingly defined by love of the brethren. He says, Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which we have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who, who, the one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. If I'll say it one more time, I'll probably say it a million more times. We are incredibly blessed to have four qualified godly men serving as shepherds of this flock. This congregation is incredibly blessed to have had a long, continuous history of godly men shepherding this flock. But there is a phrase that is like nails on a chalkboard to me, and it's men's business meetings. Those of you who do not know what that is, you are truly blessed. But it baffles my mind how Sunday morning, a congregation can all be worshiping together, praising God and, de and declaring and amening a sermon on love of the brethren. And at 2 o'clock that afternoon, when the men gathered together to make financial decisions and curriculum decisions in lieu of elders, because they have no qualified men, that they will be at each other's throats. That is not love of the brethren. I know it's not on the screen, but if you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, I know this passage is a favorite at weddings, and I believe there's a lot to be taught here about the marriage covenant. But 1 Corinthians 13 deals neither with marriage or the marriage covenant. It deals with the love of brethren, how you survive and how you work in a local congregation, how you get along with other people. Because at the end of the day, our relationship here is not of good friends or neighbors, it's of brothers and sisters. And those of us who have earthly brothers and sisters understand that there's times where we can get on each other's nerves. I'd probably do some mannerisms that probably drive some of you up the wall. I don't want to know if, you, if I do that. Let me live in my fantasy world. Um, but we have to get along with each other. We don't have a choice. If we're going to be in heaven together for eternity, we better start liking each other now. But Paul writes about, about love in 1 Corinthians 13 in verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. 
is not jealous, love does not brag, and is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, it's not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Now, he continues on to talk about where there are gifts of prophecy, they will cease. When all this is there, it will eventually cease, but love will remain until the end. The love of brethren is characterized by these attributes of being patient and long-suffering with each other, not keeping score on wrongs suffered, of not, cause, uh, not providing a cause for offense to my brother. That'd be Romans 14 right there on conscience issues. Not doctrine, but conscience issues. Things that make no difference in your standing with the Lord. Love of brethren is, even though I may have the liberty or right to do something, giving that up for the sake of my brethren. So as not to cause them to stumble in their faith. And this was, this was going to be the trait, and hopefully is the trait, that Christ said would define his followers. Looking in John chapter 15, verses 12 through 14. Excuse me, John chapter 13, we'll go back to John chapter 15, verses 34 and 35. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, Christ says here, it says, A new commandment I give to you. Now, this is the commandment John is actually referring back to in, second, in 1 John chapter 2. It says that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. With the current cultural and political climate in our country, it should not be hard for Christians to stand out in our culture. The vitriol, the hate, the not listening to each other, the speaking past each other. When two individuals who are brothers and sisters in Christ who can come together and actually disagree on something, I'm going to throw politics in right here, right now. Brothers and sisters in Christ on separate ends of the political spectrum, should be able to have a very calm and even-headed conversation about that without turning into the world and being at each other's throats. Love of Christ, love of brethren comes before all else. The big thing that's lacking in the world today is love of the, our fellow man of treating people the way you would want them to be, what way you want them to treat you. Walking the light is defined by my love of the brethren and my love of my fellow man. Because at the end of the day, each and every single one of us, including the guy who cut you off on Speedway, is made in the image of God, has a soul that needs saving. And God loves him just as much say, as he loves you and I. Next week, we will pick up where we left off. We'll be looking at chapter 2 and the big lesson here um, on how to stay in the light. Um, but with that, going back, thinking about the Gospel of John, chapter 1. In fact, let's turn there now. Gospel of John, chapter 1, as we bring this to a close. This unceasing joy, the, the ability to have fellowship with God was only made possible through Christ Jesus. It says here in First John chapter, uh, excuse me, Gospel of John chapter 1, uh, let's start in verse 4. Speaking of Christ and the Word, it says, In Him was the life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightened every man, enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even those who believe in his name, 
who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He's speaking of Christ Jesus. Christ gave up the home in heaven in order to come down and take on human flesh to die an agonizing death that he might save you and I. And to believe on Christ is to call upon his name. And the big way, the way that Christ has determined us to do that is through water uh, baptism. He says in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved.